Good evening, relatives. My name is Carolyn Fiscus. I'm also known as Big Mama. That name started a long time ago, but I've kind of grown into it. So uh, you can call me Big Mama if you want. A lot of you already know me. And a lot of you have been in my classes before, and I think you still owe me a paper. So we'll get that squared away before this class is over. Hey, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm going to be teaching the storytelling class tonight. And this is really a cut down version of the class. And I'm going to uh, try to present to you kind of some general basic principles of the storytelling tradition and then share with you some of the different kinds of stories. But I want to qualify this right up front that I am not an expert and I was not uh, born into the storytelling clan. And, um, you know, Mauna didn't come down from the heavens and tap me on the head and say, okay, from now on, you're going to know these stories. Um, the things that I know, I have worked for, I don't know, 20 years trying to gather. And I use different uh, resources. And um, I was fortunate enough back in the 70s when NICC first opened, they had a site here at Winnebago. And uh, Felix White, number one, senior, taught this kind of class. He taught language and I was lucky enough to take language from him. And at that time, when he would teach the language, he would also teach the stories behind the language. And he would talk about the different uh, heroes and trickster and those kind of things. So that's, I learned from him. And then um, I also took some history tutoring from David Smith and he knew some stories. And then the rest of the, the time uh, that I've been around Winnebago here, um, I try to talk to my mom. My mom had some stories and um, talked to other elders and people in the community. And then I also did some research on a, a site called Ho-Chunk Encyclopedia. And I'll give you that site before we leave tonight because you have a little assignment to do before next week. Now, a couple things about the class. Um, Miss um, Eleanor told me that there's no grades, there's no tests, and I was all excited about giving you guys a bunch of hard tests, but there you go. Then I'd have to check them, and I don't like to do that kind of work, but anyway, and she's going to keep the attendance, so you have to be here for some reason, uh, but there's not going to be any grades or tests. So what do we do? Just, we're going to send a spirit after them or something if they don't do well? Or? How does that work? That's up to you. Oh, she slapped that up to me, so I might do that. I might send the spirit after you to uh, shake you up a little bit so that you'll come to class. But anyway, and the other thing is, I look at the uh, signage sheet of who's all signed up for the class, and half of you could teach this class better than I am. So I'm going to encourage you to ask questions and challenge me about my information if you if you know something different. Because that's how I learn, too. I try to learn from you students. And in my 52 years of teaching, I probably learned more from my students than I ever did from, than they ever learned from me. They might learn some bad habits, but I don't want to talk about that. But um, anyway, so feel free to challenge me or ask me questions or say, well, the way I understood it, it went this way or that way. And I'm glad to, um, you know, talk about it. But I'll tell you what I know. I don't know everything. I don't pretend to know everything. Uh, but what I know, I think you could take to the bank. So uh, let's leave it at that. And please feel free to talk to me or challenge me or whatever it is you need to do. Um, I have an email address that you can get to me real easy. And it's carolynfiscus at gmail.com. Com. And I'll put that up there on that whiteboard when I put up this uh, other um, website I want you to look at. But it's Carolyn Fiscus, C A R O L Y N F I S C U S, at gmail.com. And that comes right to my uh, precious uh, device here. So if you have an issue or a question, um, I can get it on there pretty easily. Um, I don't. I used to have an email address at UNO. That's where I just retired from again. 
um, at the University of Nebraska Omaha, and it's still open, but I rarely check it. It's kind of hard to get into. So um, just kind of wanted to say about that much. So we'll get started here, and I'm going to give you a little assignment at the end of the class, and I'm going to be done about 6.30 tonight. It's, you know, 40 below outside, and I have to drive 40 miles. So I asked my boss, Eleanor, here if it'd be okay if we got done a little early. After this, we'll be here till 7.30. So just put that in your, put that in your pipe and smoke it. So uh, that's what we're gonna kind of plan on doing. I apologize for tonight short changing you. I know you paid good money for this class, didn't they? Oh, you didn't pay anything for it, so never mind. Well, anyway. <laughs> oh, geez. So let's talk about, let me introduce myself. My name is, like I said, Carolyn Fiscus. As far as I know, I'm a member of the Thunder Clan. My mom was Lorraine Maria Hunter. My grandmother was Laura Eliza DeCora. And I had uh, an auntie named Lucille Rogue, uh, another auntie um, um, named Mildred Lowe, who, by the way, passed away at Genoa Indian Boarding School. And I and my family right now are doing that kind of beating the bricks trying to find out where she is. They didn't bring her home. There's a whole story that goes to that, and I'll talk about that probably as we go through the semester. But um, um, that's who, where I come from. That's who I am. My father was non-native. His name was Lloyd Fiscus. He's a little bony Indian or German farmer over in Iowa. And that's where we made our home, over next to the river, west of Whiting, Iowa, which is, if you go uh, down here a little ways and go west, um, you could look across the river and see our, our place over there. We farmed over there. My great-grandfather got the land over there, probably just after they stole it from the tribes. But we've been there 100 years over 100 years. So um, that's where I live today. And all my family lives on that side of the river. <clears throat> this is part of the storytelling tradition is knowing these things and knowing where we come from. As an indigenous person, it's important that we know our lineage. Where did we come from? Not just for that stupid political blood quantum BS, but we also need to know it for our own uh, genetic memory, for our own um, being able to understand the ancestors as they talk to us and guide us. And for our own validation, we need to know who we are and where we come from. And that's part of storytelling. You probably heard stories as you were growing up. You know, your, your mom and dad, grandpas and grandmas talking about you know, the good old days, if there was such a thing. My mom, her name was Lorraine Hunter. She always said, there ain't no such thing as a good old day. She hated that show, The Waltons. She always thought that was a dumb show, but my dad and I liked it because it kind of reminded me of how we grew up. My grandma and grandpa lived across the field and so on. But anyway, she didn't think that was, you know, a good representation. She said that there's nothing good about the good old days. There was no running water. You had to go out to the outhouse. You had to wash clothes by hand. Yada, yada, yada. She was, she didn't like the good old days. Me, I know those good old days because that's how we grew up is in that way. And a lot of us did. A lot of your parents grew up that way too. And uh, some of you probably did too. I don't know. Was, I don't think anybody in this pile of people is as old as me, but your parents and grandparents probably are. Um, but we, mom used to tell us stories about Winnebago. She grew up over here. She just grew up from the Dollar General here. She grew up just a little bit um, into town. That first street that goes east into town, kind of up the hill, there was a little house there, and that's where my grandmother and my aunties lived, and that's where my mom grew up. And she used to tell stories about uh, Winnebago and she used to tell spooky stories. And, oh, she'd scare me and my sister to death. But we liked them, you know. So there's those kind of stories, too, that are kind of scary. But there's a purpose for them. And we'll talk about that as we go along. I'm going to uh, share with you the monsters and giants stories that we know as a people. 
And why are they important in our storytelling tradition? Now, the storytelling tradition has been mistreated since the colonization, since the white guys came and sent us away to school. They said those are old Indian myths and legends. Well, a myth and a legend, you know, from what I learned in third grade over there at Whiting, was that, oh, those are just, you know, they aren't true. They're made up stories. But what we know about our tribal traditional stories is that they are not made up. They were given to us by the ancestors. They were given to us by the entities who we tell about themselves. For instance, there's an old story about the grasshopper um, and tobacco. And the grasshopper is the one that told us that story a long, long time ago. So when I tell you that story, that came from the tobacco from the from the grasshopper. He told uh, the story on himself. It's a it's a cute little interesting story. But those stories came from the creator. They came from the mother earth. They came from the wind, the ancestors, the rain, the rivers. Rivers talk. You know, I grew up next to that big old Missouri River, and it'll tell you a lot if you sit and listen. So in, back in a long time ago, we all used to speak the same language as all our relatives that are here around us. All the, the earth, the trees, the animals, the wind, the weather, it used to, we all spoke the same language. That's what we were told. So when you have the same language as all of these entities, they could tell you a few things and you would understand what they were trying to tell you. And so in our storytelling tradition, that's what we believe. We don't think they're myth and legend. That's a bunch of hooey. That's something you, you know, can talk about. Oh, back in the day, we used to go to Bonanza and do this and do that. And, you know, those are myths and legends. But the story about, um, you know, the giants or um, the story about Wanjakaga, the trickster, those are true stories to us. So when the non-Indian made those, you know, not true, or they were just wild stories, then we begin to doubt our origins. And that's not what storytelling tradition is about. The storytelling tradition is about where we came from, and more importantly, why we are here. Why are we here? Why, why did the creator see fit for us two legs to be on the earth. Um, and how long have we been here? You know what? And uh, what is our purpose? Every morning when I make my prayers, I always ask the creator that. I said, help me to understand how I'm to be as a human being. And I think we all ask ourselves that. And our storytelling tradition helps us understand what we're supposed to be as a human being and how we're supposed to walk on this earth. Um, there's all kinds of stories. In this class, we're going to talk, focus on the origin stories, uh, superheroes, tricksters. And we're going to talk some about morality stories and law, stories that have taught us the law, how we're to get along and how we're to be as a clan, as a group, as a tribe. So we'll be talking a little bit about that as we go along here. Um, our stories are also about power and history. Oh my goodness, that's the only way we know our history is whole chunks, is from these stories. Now, luckily, some of our Native scholars and some of the uh, non-Native scholars have captured those stories from um, from traditional people, from primary resources, we call them. Or, yeah. And so if you look at this website I'm going to give you called mochunkencyclopedia.com, you will see that uh, the man who keeps that website, his name is Dieterle. He's a German, by the way, and he, uh, rec he identifies his sources. A lot of his sources are from way back, Sam Snake and some of these old Timers who were story keepers. We have those in our tribe too, the people who keep the stories. Um, in your family, you probably have those in a contemporary sense. You have somebody who kind of remembers.
years and keeps track of when people were born, what the weather was like, um, how people, you know, how their mom and dad got together, how grandma and grandma met, where they settled down. I mean, all of those old stories, those are origin stories. And, and then the power stories and the history stories come out of all of that. It's all a part of it. And we got to have it. We got to have those stories because then you begin to understand how it is you're to be as a clan member, as a family member, as a human being. You know, we, we spend a lot of our life wondering about that, I think. I mean, I'm an old lady now, and I know today I spend a lot of time thinking about, okay, how, how am I supposed to be, and how am I supposed to influence my children and grandchildren to be all that they can be? And I go back to these stories that my mom and my dad shared with me, and I go back to how they were. Um, I have a little grandson now. He's 12 years old. He's always asking about my mom. Always. One time he said he saw her visit with her at our house, and maybe her spirit was there. She sometimes knocks around in my house. My mom passed away in 2013. Anyway, my little grandson always says, he always says, Grandma, what was Grandma Lorraine like this way? What did Grandma Lorraine to do to my dad this time? There's a great story we tell about my son. He was, we were at a buffet and he was eating and he was real rude. He's smacking his lips. And my, my mom told him, quit smacking your lips. Chew with your mouth closed. And he looked at her and he was real rude. And he went like that. So she stabbed him with her fork in the leg. And he, <laughs> he went, Arr! he looked at me and I just went, she with your mouth closed. You know, what's so hard about that? She just like drove that fork into his thigh. And he was a real muscular guy, so I suppose it hurt. But my grandson now today, he always wants to hear that story about his dad. And then he always wants to know, what did you do when my dad did this? Or what did you do when my dad did that? So those stories, and sometimes I kind of get carried away and embellish the facts, which is legal for us to do. We can do that. Make those stories interesting because what does that do? My little grandson's not going to forget that story because it's embellished with uh, exciting and fun information. Um, except the stabbing thing was true. Uh, I was a little bit worried there for a while, but mom let up on him when he straightened up. Anyway, so when little kids start asking those kind of things, you know, that helps pass that story, that history, that information on. Um, it's important for us as indigenous people to do that, to keep track. And it doesn't matter if you embellish it a little bit. You know, what does that hurt? It doesn't hurt anything. And a lot of our old stories that we're going to be talking about are metaphors. You guys know what a metaphor is from junior high English? From Mrs. Koss? Um, a metaphor is a story that um, represents something real. You know, so we have, like I was telling you the grasshopper story. If you kids ever caught a grasshopper, they spit tobacco, right? Well, there's a story that goes along with that, a Ho-Chunk story where that tobacco, he liked the grasshopper liked tobacco, and Mauna told him and the, the clan council they couldn't have it. And the spirits. Mauna told them that I'm going to give this tobacco to the two legged because they're pitiful. They need to have that tobacco. And if they make a prayer and offer it to any of you spirits or any of you entities, and they ask you to do something and you take that tobacco, you have to do it. And see, right there is a metaphor. What do we do when we want somebody to do a naming or a feast or a healing? We bring them tobacco. Tobacco always comes first. Well, it comes from that story. So the grasshopper thought he was smarter than Mauna. So he said, okay, well, I'll hold on to the tobacco until the two-legged take it. And so what he did is he took it and he just started eating it because he liked it. It tasted so good. He ate it, ate it, ate it, gorged himself on that tobacco. 
And he got sick and fell over. And Mauna said, what's the matter with you? And the grasshopper was like coughing and choking up tobacco. And uh, Mauna knew right away, oh, I see what you did. Okay, you're going to pay for that from now until forever. He said, from now until forever, you're going to be spitting up that tobacco. Every time you get excited or bothered or somebody grabs you, you're going to cough and choke and spit tobacco. Well, that's what grasshoppers do today. So it's a metaphor for that use of that tobacco and how, you know, that um, grasshopper was greedy, you know, and he gorged himself. And so even today, grasshoppers spit tobacco. So that's just one tiny example. We'll have a lot of those, but these stories are lessons and metaphors for how it is for it to be as a human being. And sometimes we get it, and sometimes we're like, that's a dumb story. I didn't get that, you know? I don't understand it. And there's a lot of stories like that, too, you have to spend some time on to think about. I have a great story. I don't know whether to tell you guys this or not. It's about Wajak Kaga, the trickster. Wachakaga in the stories is always kind of this kind of monkey, the kind of goofy guy or gal. I think it's kind of a neuter, uh, you know, like uh, he doesn't have a gender, but he's a trickster. He's referred to in the stories as he, but, you know, that's neither here nor there. But there's a story about uh, why men have short penises. And I'd really like to tell that story, but I don't know if it's appropriate for this audience. You'll have to let me know. Um, because back in the way, back in the days, it said that men had nine foot penises. And there's a great story that goes along with that that I like to tell, but you know, I don't want to offend anybody, especially you men. But we'll talk about, see if that's going to be appropriate later on when we talk about the trickster. Um, our stories are about metaphors, power, history. They were also done for entertainment. And I never used to teach this class until the spring semester because the snow has to be on the ground before we can tell the stories. Um, I am not sure why. Maybe some of my relatives out there know and you can inform us. Um, it has to do with uh, uh, entities that can come up and steal our stories. So I know in Navajo land down in the Southwest, they don't tell stories or play, play those string games until the snow's on the ground because they don't like the snake to come out and steal stuff. So, but I don't think we have any snake taboos or anything that I know of, but maybe we do, but um, there's some, I know there's some rules around when you can tell stories. Um, we tell them for entertainment. After the snow falls, everybody's in the lodge, stinking it up, eating, laying around. So uh, our storytelling relatives, whoever was the storyteller in our family, they would tell these stories. And the kids would love it, and the young people would love it. And it'd be good teaching. It's like going to school. It's homeschooling, actually. Um, in the summer, we don't do that. Why? You don't want people laying around in the house playing video games all summer, do you? You want them out working, cutting wood, preparing for the winter. So we didn't tell those stories like that in the lodge in the summer and spring. There was things to do. Bows to make, arrows to make, fishing, drying of meat. I mean, just think if we didn't have all this uh, technology, we'd have to, like today, half of us would croak because we would not have been prepared for 40 below or whatever it was. We didn't, you know, been out there in our little thin hoodies. And, but in the old days, you know, and traditionally, um, during the spring and summer and fall, people worked to get ready for this time. So there's a lot of stories about that, too. How do you get ready? How do you hunt a bear? What do you do to prepare a bear skin? And we have stories for everything. You pick something, there's a story for it. And the human condition, oh, my goodness. There's stories not only from our tribe, but I'll probably share some stories from other tribes too. And I'd invite you to share stories that you know where it talks about the human condition: anger, rage, jealousy, uh, happiness, love. We have all those stories. 
Um, law and morality, those are key in storytelling tradition. Because how do you know how you're supposed to be in your family or your clan if you don't, if you aren't taught? And the storytelling tradition was the teacher. Um, cause and effect. Why does uh, why does a raccoon have black stripes on him? There's a good story for that. I'll tell you that next time we get together. Uh, monsters and giants. You know what? Anth anthropologists and archaeologists, they're discovering now remains of giants. We've been talking about them for thousands of years. And they're all oh, you Indians, you just made those stories up. Well, no. We had to fight the giants. Actually, Mauna sent his first three sons down here to help us not get eaten up by the giants. Mauna put us on the earth, and the giants were already here, and they started eating us. So um, Mauna sent his sons, Redhorn. The other guy was Rabbit, Turtle, and then there was one called Hirschadina. He was a one-legged, he was a deformed little boy. And he couldn't do very much. And the creator felt real bad that he was disabled like that. So he gave him the job of watching over the underworld. And we believed in an underworld. Not hell, but an underworld. Much like um, if you ever read anything about the Mayan uh, civilization or their belief system, they have three worlds. Underworld, then there's this world, and then there's the spirit world. And it's not like Lord of the Rings, but <laughs> we didn't have that belief. And so here's Janina, the little one-legged uh, disabled boy, he was in charge of the underworld. And there were times when it's believed that we had to go that journey, the underworld, and then we went up to the spirit world, especially if you were a warrior. When you passed away or killed in battle, uh, there was a trip that you made, and part of it was going through the underworld. And uh, it wasn't that you went down there and they said, wow, did you, were you a sinner? Were you a good boy or what? It's just that's part of the journey. And I think that's an interesting lesson for us to realize is that sometimes there's no real challenge to our life other than we have to go through that journey. It's part of what we know we have to do. So there's that, um, monster, uh, plants and medicines. There's stories about those things. What we know from the stories is that how tribes, and I'm not just talking about the whole chunk, but I'm talking about a lot of tribes here in the Plains, how their medicine people found out about medicine, what medicine plants were good for, you know, to do things with was through dreams and through stories. And once they had a dream or experience, then they created that story that passed it on to the next generation. How do you gather this kind of medicine? And I know the Ho-Chunk back in Wisconsin, they had lots and lots of good medicine. Same way here in the, in the prairie, the Omaha, Lakotas, Ho-Chunks. My mom used to talk about medicine uh, when she was growing up. She said my grandmother would take the girls down to the timbers and they would gather medicines. Now, my mom couldn't remember what they were or anything, but I thought that was so amazing. And I've learned that um, there's red willow bark that has the same uh, makeup as acetosilic acid. And Bayer aspirin, which we use for fever and inflammation and all that, that's red willow bark. It's the same chemical makeup, acetosilic acid. So, our people knew all those things. Wouldn't that be so cool if we could just do like we do with our computer, go into the file, go into our genetic file and say, um, you know, grandma, help me. I get, I think we can. The old timers used to know how to do that. We probably could do it, but we're so obsessed with, you know, the bachelorette and all that stuff and TV and computers and our devices that, we don't let our brain get that powerful anymore. So we need to work on that. There's stories about that. <clears throat> okay, are there any questions in the chat or? Um, oh, my daughter wants to know about the story about twins. About who? Twins. Oh, okay. We'll talk about the twins. 
They're an interesting crew. They were the sons of Red Horn. This is what I know in a quick cliff notes. They were the sons of Red Horn and they had a lot of power and the giants caught up to old Red Horn and chopped his head off once. And the twin boys who were kind of always like, you know how boys are, they were kind of always like not paying attention, but they were really into wrestling and sports. When they heard that the giants chopped the head of their dad off, they were really mad. So they went to their father, Red Horn's body, and said, we'll avenge this. That was the thing, you know, revenge. And so they chased that giant clear over to uh, Lake Winnebago or to the Superior Lake or to the Great Lakes. And when they got there, they fought him and wrestled him and beat him up and tried to get their dad's head back. Because he was running along, bouncing that head on the back of his back, running down, and they were like, we'll get you, you dirty scoundrel, you know. So they chased him down. They finally got the head back, and they killed the giant. I don't know exactly how. I don't remember that. I'll have to look it up, Bella. And then they took the head back to their father's body, and they put it on there, and he came back to life. I don't know what else they did. I don't know that part. But that's all I know about them right now, but I'll have more uh, when we talk about the twins. But most of the um, ancient cultures had uh, superheroes who were twins. That's very common and it's very important in, uh, um, and sometimes these twins were the same and sometimes they were opposite of each other. They had different personalities and maybe even different gender. You know, one might have been a male and one might have been a female. I've read twin stories, not from the Ho-Chunk, but from other tribes. I think that maybe, uh, I'll have to check, but that's a good story, that twin one. And you know what we can do with these stories too? I just kind of discovered lately. If you know a story and you can pray that story, Sometimes you can, it's real powerful and it can fix things. Like if somebody's kind of getting dementia or they're having head issues, head trauma, you can pray that twin story that they uh, chased after the giant, grabbed his head and put it back on there. It's a metaphor for getting your senses back, right? And the dad came back to life and they went on. And Redhorn has a long, long cycle of stories. And even today, there's evidence of uh, how powerful the Redhorn uh, character is. There's a cave. It's called the, um, well, it's called the Redhorn cycle. And it's a painting, a cave painting over east um, in those caves along the Mississippi River. That is a picture of Red Horn and um, a celestial happening. We don't understand exactly what it was, but you know, there's lots and lots of stories that go along with astronomy. And I love those stories. I have a few of those that I know. But uh, Red Horn, you know, in, this, in the warrior stories, Red Horn is the evening star. Or the morning star, I'm sorry, the morning star. I pointed here and I was like, wait a minute. And blue horn is the evening star. Now we know that they're planets, right? But to the to the ancient uh, Ho-Chunk, in order to make order and sense of everything, that's who they became. If you guys ever paid attention to the um, morning star, sometimes it's red. And then that evening star is blue because I think it's, is it Venus or they're both Venus? Anyway, um, those are the two characters. They're superheroes in our storytelling tradition, but one is always with us in the morning and one is always with us in the evening. In the evening when that blue horn is called the uh, warrior, the warrior star. I know sometimes when we're at war, I sometimes look to that star in the evening and pray for protection for our boys and girls that are at war, you know. I don't know if that works or not, but it makes, it brings me joy and peace. So that's, you know, that's important too, to you as an individual. What stories bring you joy and what stories calm you down? Which stories help heal? 
you know, even either yourself or someone else. So we have that kind of power, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we can get it back too. We all have our, our brains. So anyway, and then there's a lot of clan origin stories in, in this website I'm going to uh, give you. That's going to be your assignment for next week. I want you to look up your clan origin story. Maybe you already know it. Now, the last time I taught this class, which has been 2012 or, yeah, 2012 or 13, um, there were certain clans that they could not tell those stories outside of ceremony. And I respect that. I know that. And if you try to find them even on the website, you won't find them because nobody would tell dearly, oh, yeah, here's our clan origin story. What we do know from the stories is that Mauna put together a clan council. And that clan council was uh, created and Mauna put them down on the earth to straighten the earth out and to make it livable. And then uh, as time went on, of course, then the two-leggeds uh, adopted a relationship with those clan councils. And that's to this day. You know your clan. You have a relationship with that clan. And we know there are 12, right? Four sky clans and eight earth clans. And then there are friend clans. And there's a story about why they are friends. And those friend clans help each other during ceremony. They bury each other. They have uh, if they go to war, they help each other, you know, go to war. And there's a lot of responsibility to be a friend to another clan. And when I first started working on a reservation and learning these things, I did not know about that relationship. But since then, lo and these 20 years later, since I've been around here, I see how that works out. You know, like, uh, like for instance, if I, God forbid, were to pass out, pass out, pass on, make my journey, then I'm Thunder Clan, so the Evil Clan, I think, is my friend. And so someone from Evil Clan, I, you know, my family could ask them to bury me. And then their obligation is to try to do that, try to take care of me. So, and I think that's my friend. Hawk and Pigeon. Yeah, anyway, we'll talk about those. I have them. I don't have them memorized, unfortunately. I'm a bad clan person. Okay, so I'm going to put the name of the uh, website up here on the whiteboard. This is all kind of new to me, so. So there's a request for your clan story. I have about six people want to know the penis story. So want to know the what? The penis story. The penis story? Okay, I'll tell it next week for sure. I don't want to embarrass Eleanor. <laughs> when men used to have nine-foot penises, you guys don't know that story? I think they just want to hear it again. Oh. <laughs> I'll tell you next week because it requires me to get up and do some uh, acting. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll do it next week. Remind me next week, okay? So anyway, you need to go to... Hold on, let me turn your mastery real quick. And then you can... Sorry. Okay. I was almost ready. Over here? No, you just... I'm sorry, my producer is a little... Okay, ready? Yep. Okay. find it, the clan origin story, your clan origin story, and then um, Earthmaker story. In other words, and I'm going to tell you that story here in just a second. And then the third thing you want to look up is the clan council. Now, since there are no tests or anything, um, you know, you're going to go, well, I got to look at that. 
You might want to, you know, run copies or make a file for yourself so you can remember these stories and tell your kids or grandkids. Or maybe you can teach this class next time. Eleanor's always looking for people who want to work. Um, so anyway, let's talk about the Earthmaker story. Earthmaker Mauna, as I understand, um, he was kind of laying around the cosmos and looking around, and he was like lonely. He said, I need to do something. I need to make something. I have all this power, and I'm just wasting it. So he took a piece of his side out of his celestial body, whatever that is. I'm trying to think what Earthmaker would look like. But it's not that white guy with the beards like in the Bible, okay? It's some kind of powerful entity. And they took a piece of their celestial being and he rolled it up in a big old ball and then he went like this. And a, supposedly the way the story goes, that when he did that, it shot out all of these particles that became the planets and the stars and all that we know as the universe today. Now, we might say, oh, come on, big mama. But think about it. It's a metaphor for what? What's a metaphor for? What do today astrophysicists talk about how our universe started? What's the theory? The Big Bang, right? It's not just a TV show. But the Big Bang theory is that at some time or another, these particles um, imploded on each other and created this huge explosion. And it threw all of these particles and all of these uh, um, things out into what we know today as the universe. And it's called the Big Bang Theory. And we're traveling at a gazillion miles an hour from this center place, wherever it was. We as ho people, or as Native people, say, well, that's from the Creator, from Mauna. He, he started all that, or she, or whoever he is, whatever it is. And they'll go, what? Well, that's just as, that makes just as much sense as the astrophysicists. Well, these little particles crashed into each other and created this big, yeah, right. That sounds dumb to me, but now when somebody tells me Mauna did it, an entity, omnipotent entity, now that makes sense to me. Because I'm a believer, right? So this big bang started, and that's how he started it. Well, he picked one, one of these particles, this, uh, and we call it Earth, okay? Or I think in our language it's Ma. I'm not sure. But um he picked that one to really uh, work on. He was kind of bored and created the universe. Now it's like, okay, now what do I do? So he took the one, one little planet, zooming around this star, and he said, okay, I'm going to do something with this. And he, he, when he first took it or looked at it, it was like a wobbly, gelled up mess of water and clouds and volcanoes and whatever. It was just all whatever. And the way I understand it is he decided, well, I better try to do something with this. And the first thing he thought was that he needed to slow it down so it didn't fly off the edge of the galaxy. So he started to slow it down a little bit. But what he did was he created the clan council. And the clans were each assigned to do something to this wobbly mess of planet to calm it down and to make it into something. So for instance, he took those uh, bears, the bear clan, he said, now you guys are big and strong and I'm gonna put you at each cardinal point on this planet. And I want you to, to stabilize it. Don't let it wobble all around everywhere it wants to. They're like, sure boss, I can do that. And so he placed them at these cardinal points. And I think even today, I might be wrong, but I think even today there's a, there's a ceremony that talks about those bears and what they did. And I know in the medicine lodge, they have a special place um, 
placed in a lot. And uh, then he took the snakes and said, now you guys, you know, you're long and you're strong. You can wrap around and make sure the earth only goes one direction when it's traveling. Keep it spinning like a little cage. So the snake clan stabilized the earth inside their little snake cage to keep it on its right rotation, right? So he went on down the line and everybody had a job, right? Everybody had a, had something to do with stabilizing and making the earth livable. You know, and the, the mountains were formed and the lakes were formed and there's entities. Water spirit clan takes care of those lakes, right? And the oceans and the rivers. And then we have the wolf clan. Now wolf clan and buffalo and some of those others were given a responsibility of working with the two-legged set he's going to put on this plan. And there's a story that goes along with that too, the first man. And it's interesting to me because in the story that I know, first man comes from the north. And he put him down here and um, his name was uh, Kuno. The second one came from the east. He put another guy down there. And of course, that's Hena. And then Haga came out of the south and Nanje came out of the west. And so there were these four men who Mauna put on the earth and they are not related to each other at all. They were individual human creations by the creator. Well, you know how guys are after a while. They get to, you know, messing up their abode and saying, you know what? We're kind of lonely down here. So they made prayers and really prayed to Mauna that, you know, we need some company. You know what that means when you talk to young men, what kind of company are they looking for? Young women. So they prayed to Mauna to give them someone who would be compatible with them, who they could, you know, create life, create a life with, and they wouldn't be lonely anymore. So then Mauna created women. The first woman came from the north, and her name was Hinu, of course, right? The second woman came from the east, and her name was what? Hinu Weha. The one that came from the south, her name was Tiga. And the one who came from the west was Nanke. And so that's how those women got on the planet, because the creator made sure that the men had company. So that's kind of the foundational story for how we got here. Now, right away, the creator saw that we were kind of pitiful. We're naked, we're cold, we don't know how to do anything. So then he begins to send these other clan council members down to teach us and help us learn how to survive. I always tell my students at UNO, us humans, us two ladies are the most pitiful entity on the earth. Because I would never get a bunch of coyotes or cockroaches to zoom in and listen to me. But you guys did. We're pitiful. And coyotes don't wear, you know, Adidas and Nike and warm clothes. They have their warm clothes. They don't need that stuff. So, you know, we're kind of pitiful if you think about it. And that's the teachings from those things. That's why we need the clans to help us to understand how it is we're to be as a human being. And I'm still working on it. Some of you young folks got a few years to go, I know. But I think you're doing okay. So I don't know about those women in my family. I'm a little worried about them. Hey, tea woman and sweet and patty. Hey, I'm just Dee Dee. <laughs> but I'm glad you're listening to me tonight, I guess. But anyway, uh, so that's kind of the beginning. That's what I know about that origin. Now, there's origin stories for everything that we see on the earth. I don't know all of them, but there are stories. But I want you guys to bear down on the clan, your clan origin story. And then the other thing for your assignment is you're supposed to write your own origin story. Embellish it if you want. My mom, she used to tease us and tell us we were pooped on a fence post by old crows. 
That's where we came from. I don't know why she had to tell us that, but she and my little sister Brenda, she always told that too. I think it was to keep us humble. It didn't keep Brenda humble though, just to, just so you know. But anyway, so you guys need to write a paper, a couple of paragraphs that talk about your origin. And you know, embellish it. Come down. Um, a lot of tribes in this part of the country, we came from the stars, you know. And uh, there's, you know, if you ever watch Ancient Aliens, I believe in UFOs, by the way. If you ever watch Ancient Aliens, they always talk about traditional tribal people have these stories about they came from the stars. And if you think about it, we did. We came from Mauna's Big Bang Theory, right? And then he put us on the earth as two legged. There's a story about that keeping that tobacco too. Why, why are we keeping it? You know, so we can offer it and get our prayers taken care of. And all kinds of stories like that. So are there any questions? Uh-oh. It's gonna blow. Are there any questions? Can you see in the chat? The story of the giant seemed very similar to a genetic story. Story of the what? The story of some, a couple of people were talking about how the twins and the giants seem very similar to yeah. a genetic story. Yeah, a lot of tribes have a twin story. And they're superheroes usually. And so that would be, make sense that it would be uh, similar. The other thing is, I always wonder which came first, the chicken or the egg. Sometimes some of our stories match a Bible story, for instance. And it's like, wait a minute. Did they impound that? Did they ingrain that in us? Or did they copy us? You know, which might be. There's a, another question about what the giants were like and where did they come from? From what I understand, and that's a that's a good question too. The giants were giant, but there was this. There's a cycle of stories about the giants. Something about they have ice in their stomach, and I'm not sure what that's about. But if you think about it in terms of uh, archaeological or geological age, maybe they were glaciers. If you think about it, um, like the glacier came down right by here, you know, and over north or over west a little ways. So maybe those giants, maybe that was a metaphor for the glacier activity. Because we've been, not maybe all ho tribes, but tribes were here when the last glacier was here. So maybe that was a metaphor for that. I don't know, but it's a good thing to think about. I'll try to figure it out. I think it was the glaciers. <coughs> so, how are you going to kill the glaciers? Get out of their way or just wait till they quit? You know, the Missouri River was formed from a glacier, the melt. And, you know, they're finding out all this stuff now that we've known for a long time. They're finally finding out, oh, yeah, well, you know, these navies used to say this. And sure enough. <laughs> Someone just commented that there are a lot of Right. Yep. And there are here too. You go north here up by Sisten and left and those potholes go over east. Um, there's a part of northeastern Iowa that's called the Drift Driftless area. It was all glacier at one time. And our Mochum people inhabited that and built mounds there. So there's a lot of if a person had time to follow up with all of this, you'd find out we knew all this stuff a long time ago as indigenous people. We're so smart. We're so uh, insightful and we pay attention to things. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, is it okay if I let you go? I have to ask the boss. Eleanor? I think they have a limited amount of Oh, so don't get your assignment because I'll ask you next time about it. 
You can email it to me if you want, your written assignment about your origin. I'd like you to do that. Carolyn Fiscus at gmail.com. I'll type it in the chat. He's going to chat it in the type. So if there's no more uh, questions or concerns, I wish you relatives good night. Be safe tonight. Don't get to say your prayers. Be grateful for your day. We're all still here taking a breath on this side. I am grateful. <laughs>